I'm Crystal Parikh. Um, I am the director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at New York University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our program tonight, Making Peace with Ghosts, War, Food, and Memory in Korea and Hawaii. I'd like to begin um, by taking a moment to acknowledge that the APA Institute at NYU is located on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We would like, also like to recognize that New York City is currently home to approximately 100,000 people who identify as indigenous, including many peoples from the Pacific. We at the Institute affirm our commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, and today we're offering a few ways to support Native and Indigenous communities. This semester, we are highlighting the American Indian Community House, the Mount Kia, Kia Legal Defense Fund, and We Are Guahan. Tonight's event is part of our year-long focus at the APA Institute on the theme of recovery and repair. In the face of a global pandemic, newly visible violence against Asian Pacific Americans and myriad economic environmental and environmental uncertainties, we have, begun to, uh, we have been moved to seek collective modes of recovery and repair. As we mourn those who have been lost, we look to traditional and new modes of healing that Asian Pacific Americans have fostered. We hope to look to the past, striving to recover the knowledge and resources it might offer us for addressing the many contemporary challenges facing Asian and Pacific Americans and for understanding better what might con constitute resilience and flourishing for our communities. We'd like to thank the NYU Native Studies Forum for their co-sponsorship of this event, and I'd like to sound a personal note of thanks to the staff at the APA Institute for all their hard work in making tonight's event possible. Um, I'd also like to give a very special thanks to Mariko Chin Whiteneck uh, for curating uh, this wonderful event tonight. Marika will be introducing the other speakers, but let me say a word of introduction for her. Um, Marika is an American Cities PhD candidate at New York University. Um, her dissertation examines the early 20th century uh, excuse me, reforestation of Hawaiian watersheds to understand how sustainability discourses and practices re-articulate and contribute to settler colonial capitalism and racial hierarchies on and through the land. Her research interests include histories of US empire and feminist science and technology studies. Marika will be um, presenting um, work in progress um, at the APA uh, grad students working group this Friday. Um, there are flyers available at the entrance um, if you'd like to get more information on that working group. So without further delay, I'll um, go ahead and uh, welcome Marika to the uh, podium. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's really exciting to me that this event is finally happening. Um, uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, Mary Tutti Baker Kanaka Maoli is an assistant professor in comparative indigenous studies at Western Washington University on the lands of the Lactamish and Nutsak peoples. She earned her PhD in political science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa with specializations in indigenous politics and futures studies. Her work examines the relationship between Kanaka Maoli values and practice and the politics of decolonization. She's currently working on a manuscript entitled The Land is in Us, Embodied Aloha Aina Enacting Indigenous Futures, which is a critical examination of Aloha Aina as an indigenous ideology. Her most recent publication is A Garden of Political Transformation, Indigenism, Anarchism, and Feminism Embodied, which examines the diverse practices that coalesce around the ideological principles of Aloha Aina and Anarcha Indigenism, a worldview grounded in indigenous land-based practice and knowledge systems, and anarchist principles of fluid leadership in horizontal power structures. Joseph Hahn is the author of Nuclear Family, a New York Times book review's editor's choice, named a best book of the year by NPR and Time Magazine. His book was long listed for the 2023 Penn Hemingway Award for debut novel and received the 2023 Asian Pacific American Literature Award Adult Fiction honor. He was selected as a 2022 National Book Foundation Five Under 35 honoree and received a Kundiman Fellowship in Fiction. His work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Lit Hub, and Catapult. He's an editor for the West Region of Joyland Magazine and an affiliate faculty in fiction at the Antioch University Los Angeles Low Residency MFA program. 
Currently, he serves as the Distinguished Writer in Residence in the English Department at the University of Hawaii Manoa. He ile Julia Kavehi Pua'a Kaha Opulani Hobart, Kanaka Maoli, is Assistant Professor of Native and Indigenous Studies at Yale University. An interdisciplinary scholar, she researches and teaches on issues of settler colonialism, environment, and indigenous sovereignty. Her first book, Cooling the Tropics, Ice, Indigeneity, and Hawaiian Refreshment, is a recipient of Duke University Press's Scholars of Color First Book Award. Her articles have appeared in refereed journals such as NAIS, Media and Environment, Food, Culture, and Society, and the Journal of Transnational American Studies, among others. She's the co-editor of the special issue, Radical Care for Social Text 2020, and the editor of Foodways of Hawaii, Rutledge 2018. She's currently working on a project about cultural memory, commemoration, and hauntings in Hawaii State Parks, which I think is what we're gonna hear a bit about tonight. I can't wait. Um, and finally, Juyun Park is a member of Norudol for Korean Community Development, and they are currently the engagement editor at The Real News, an independent media organization. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and um, let's get started. Oh, Judy Baker, Koi Noa, um, my Ko'olau Poko, Ma Oahu my Ao. I am Judy Baker, and I'm from the Ko'olau Poko um, district of Oahu, um, in Hawaii. And um, I want to start by giving my heartfelt mahalo to Mariko for thinking up this. Um, and, and inviting me to this amazing uh, discussion, intriguing discussion, I'm sure, um, and to APA for the invitation as well. Thanks to Amita and, and all the folks who put so much effort to bring us all together. And um, I'm really excited to share some of my thoughts with you. First off, I'm a Kanaka Maoli, as I said, a Native Hawaiian teaching at a university on the lands of the Lactamush and Nooksack peoples in what is now called Bellingham, Washington. And here we are um, standing, sitting on the traditional homelands of the Lenape peoples. Um, lots of ghosts in the room, right? Um, I, I grew up next door to my Hawaiian grandparents in Ko'olapoko. And um, my mother's mother, Lucy Kahikina, was born to Kane Kolia and Amarillo Hazard Perry uh, in the Kohala Mountains on Hawaii Island. My mother's father, Edwin Puahaulani, was born to a Hawaiian mother and grew up in a fishing village in Anahola on Kauai. My grandparents were born when Hawaii was an independent nation. A white oligarchy deposed the lawful native government when they were still babies, and eventually this oligarchy gave the islands to the United States. As young adults, both my grandparents decided to put on the mask of whiteness. They moved from their rural homes to Honolulu, where my grandmother taught school, and my grandfather parlayed his skill as a money manager into a career in politics. So that's a brief introduction of me. Introductions like this um, are important part of the protocols that we, um, that we use to acknowledge relationships that are both material and aspirational. Um, these, rela these relationships are vital first steps to what I think of as a decolonial future, um, or decolonial futures. So before I continue with my comments, I want us to um, participate in a really modified version of the protocols practiced at Ho'ulu Aina. And, and um, just as a note, uh, I'm sure many of you have read the book, uh, Nuclear Family, and the protocol that, that just writes about so um, eloquently um, of introduction. And, you know, we can't all form a circle and say our name and, and um, the ancestor we're bringing with us, but I'd love it if you would turn to somebody that you don't know and 
And then just take a moment to say your name, uh, your homeland, the, um, and the ancestor that's with you, or one of the ancestors that's with you tonight, um, and, th and then listen to your partner. Let's just take a few minutes to do that, if we might. Okay, go for it. I would love to hear different um, um, stories of ancestors that are in the room, but uh, we've, we've brought them in the room now. So Marco asked me to speak about um, theorization of vai vai, which is abundance in English, um, as an economic model for a decolonial futures. Vai vai is one element of an emerging land-based praxis grounded in Kanakamali ancestral knowledge. Other elements include aloha aina, or love of the land, kuleana, um, reci reciprocating responsibility, um, and many others, but those are the ones that my work really focuses on. My academic work looks at the ways that um, these uh, indigenous land-based practices and knowledge systems work with principles from anarchist and feminist traditions of horizontal power structures and fluid anti-patriarchal leadership models that open up possibilities for, for imagining worlds beyond the control of colonial capitalism and developing strategies to get there. The concepts I write about emerge from the Aina, the land and all that feeds us. It was and continues to be made real with my with my hands in the mud at Ho'ulu Aina and other sites of native Hawaiian um, resurgence. Because these concepts emerge from and in relationship to land, we need to begin with the specific in order to understand practice that is theory. We begin then in Kalihi Valley, the home of Ho'ulu Aina and Kokua Kalihi Valley Comprehensive Family Services. Kalihi is a working class community in Honolulu's urban core. Free flowing streams from the forested uplands are confined to man-made channels in the lowlands. The banks of these sluggish canals are crowded with warehouses, industrial complexes, and occasional encampment, encampments of houseless people. The water's journey ends at Mamala Bay. The constant movement of cargo into Honolulu Harbor and the hundreds of flights leaving and arriving in Honolulu International Airport daily has devastated the once abundant near shore fishing grounds. Adjacent to the airport, Hickam Air Force Station and Fort Stafter Army Base provide services to the ever present military. Industrialization and immigration are the stories carved into the Kalihi landscape. Ho'ulu Aina is a 100-acre complex of gardens and forest reserve operated by Kokua Kalihi Valley Comprehensive Family Services, which we all call KKV, a federally qualified health center that serves over 10,000 community members annually. It's um, in operation since 1972. The organization works to foster health in the broadest sense physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. At, at, as the movement for Kanakamali self-determination was building in the 70s, a group of women, primarily Pacific Island immigrants living in Kalihi, um, it, living in Kalihi public housing, began working with a local social worker to bring services to Kalihi that state and local governments were unable or unwilling to provide. The result was KKV, a vibrant organization that has been serving Kalihi for over 50 years. Ho'ulu Aina emerges out of a desire at KKV to introduce Hawaiian land-based practice into their healthcare facility. Under the leadership of Kanaka Maoli artists and uh, practitioners, Ho'ulu Aina has become a welcoming place for, for newcomers and a place of native Hawaiian resurgence. It has grown into a site where Kanaka Maoli immigrants and settlers alike come to heal from the trauma of displacement. I was introduced to Ho'ulu Aina while in graduate school at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I went regularly to community work days at Ho'ulu Aina 
And my, um, I, I write here my understanding, but also my healing really comes from working there. Um, I, I, I deepened my understanding of what Aloha Aina really embodies, um, of kuleana, of that reciprocating responsibility, and vai vai, an economy based on abundance. Over the more than a decade that Ho'ulu Aina has been in operation, vai vai has developed into the dominant practice. Staff, patients, and community work the garden alongside each other, and as they bring life to the life from the land, they bring life to themselves. KKV doctors are known to prescribe a morning of gardening at Ho'ulu Aina for clinic patients. Vai Vai, though, was not always practiced at Ho'ulu Aina. Uh, Puni Jackson, Ho'ulu Aina's program director, recalls that in the early days, volunteer farmers were stealing eggplants from each other. Fighting over eggplants, she observed, is a behavior that comes from deficit thinking, believing that we have to hold on to what we have because there is not enough. Mm -hmm. Deficit thinking drives the capitalist market economy that thrives on manufactured scarcity. Vai Vai, on the other hand, is driven by generosity, sharing, and reciprocity. When we practice Vai Vai, there is and will be enough. Gardeners no longer steal eggplants from each other. Master gardeners and their interns at Ho'ulu Aina plan and work the garden, and the community comes to work the Aina alongside friends and neighbors and strangers as well. Um, the lead doctor at KKV, Dr. David Duroth, provided an excellent description of how Vai Vai Economics works on the ground during a conversation um, with a group of health administrations administrators who were touring KKV. These were, um, I think they were part of the presidential, um, some presidential panel bringing Pacific Islander health um, people together. So they were all from across the United States at Ho'ulu Aina. Um, and one of these visitors asked why the garden wasn't divided into small plots of land that then would be allotted to individuals to cultivate as they see fit. Dr. Duroff responded that there will never be enough land for all those who want to garden. And a power structure would have to, they would have had to create a power structure to manage the scarcity. Community gardeners, he said, he pointed out at Ho'ulu Aina, come, together, come to work together under the guidance of Ho'ulu Aina staff to create Vai Vai to create this abundance and, and to really create abundance not only for themselves but for those who may not have access to those experiences, right? And to fresh, just even to have access to fresh food. Work at Ho'ulu Aina is joyful. People take care of each other. And prior to the pandemic, Ho'ulu Aina hosted hundreds of people every week. And, um, at, 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 I was, in my interviews, feeling the, the sense of pressure that they were going through, like, hmm, maybe too, is, there, is there possibly too much vai vai? Um, but they, 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 they had to rethink um, and, and re-understand vai vai, which they're still doing now. But if you go to Hawa Oahu, you can still work at um, Ho'ulu Aina. At its heyday, and even, even now when, when it's just not 300 people coming to work in the gardens, but 10 people, you would find students from high, local high schools um, and colleges fulfilling service learning requirements, um, patients, staff, and volunteers from KKV um, um, also coming up for respite, and, and a lot of Kanaka Maoli and other um, other people engaged in land, um, land and environmental um, restoration activities um, and struggles who would come again for respite to enjoy um, um, a little bit of that care um, and, and um, to recover from soul-wrenching entanglements with the settler state. So at community work days, 
fruits and vegetables um, harvested are put on tables for participants to take home. Um, everyone is encouraged to uh, take as much as they need for their own table and to share with family and friends. And um, at Holu Aina, Vaivai Economics is structured so that there's no direct correlation between the cash that many people will donate to um, Holu Aina because, oh, okay, I think my time's up. Mm -hmm. The cash that Ho'olu Aina is, it, uh, needs to operate in, in our present day system and the kinds of work that they do and um, you know, the fresh vegetables that, that um, they can take home to share with their families. Um, and so just in closing, Kanaka Maoli at Ho'olu Aina have tapped into the rooted knowledge of place in order to cultivate a praxis of Aloha Aina, love of the land, the, um, the organization that has emerged out of this work is a kipuka aloha aina, or an oasis of practice. A brilliant Kanakamali scholar, Noel Peralto, um, theorized kipuka aloha aina as spaces of resurgence that are moving beyond state-centric notions of nation building. Uh, and the movement this movement is facilitated by the praxis of embodied, uh, embodied work, embodied learning how to work the land um, and, and take that kind of recipro reciprocating responsibility or kuleana and, and how to, to envision the world as um, vai vai. And this is a practice, praxis that models preferred futures in which Kanakamali immigrants and settlers form a a lahui or a people who live and work outside of the bounds of the colonial structure of oppression, capitalism, and heteropatriarchy. Thank you so much for being here on a Wednesday night. I'm so grateful to Mariko for all of your amazing work and thinking through and putting this panel together. Uh, thank you to the Institute, Amita, Linda, everyone here helping out. Um, this is one of the greatest honors um, to be on this panel um, to, uh, s since the publication of this book. Um, and I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity um, to see this book as a bridge um, in a way that's connected me to so many um, people and communities. So thank you so much for being here. A uh, nuclear family, uh, if I had to describe in five words, would be, uh, it would be a Korean stoner ghost <laughs> story. Korean stoner <laughs> ghost story. Uh, less than five words. Um, but Nuclear Family is about uh, a Korean family in Hawaii that runs a series of plate lunch restaurants um, and they have goals of franchising, um, but they soon face backlash after the eldest son of the family, Jacob Cho, gets caught attempting to cross the Korean demilitarized zone into North Korea. Um, and the family doesn't know that Jacob has been possessed by the ghost of his late, long lost uh, maternal grandfather who will stop at nothing to return to the North where he left his family behind um, all those years ago um, during the mass shuffle um, of, of folks ac across the peninsula. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to do something different. I always usually read from the first chapter of the book, uh, but this time I'm going to read from the last chapter. Um, and the book leads up to a depiction of the 2018 false missile alert. And I really want to pinpoint on that word false. Um, and also in thinking about system failures by and large that are repeatedly occurring 
um, all around Hawaii with regard to the U.S. military um, and the damaging and irreparable damage that this occupation has had on the land of Hawaii, but also uh, on in, uh, throughout the communities um, adjacent to these sites, um, namely uh, the spill of jet fuel into our sole primary drinking aquifer um, from the Red Hill bulk fuel storage facility, the spilling of firefighting foam, which contains PFAS. Uh, concurrently with this event, um, the journalist John Mitchell is screening a documentary about PFAS contamination happening um, all throughout Okinawa. And, um, and I was really fortunate to see a screening of that film um, when he came through Hawaii. Um, but on the notion of the, the false missile alert, um, I want to connect that to the larger fiction of U.S. imperialism and the rampant militarization of the entire planet and the fiction that the U.S. will keep us safe, the fiction of national security, that it is only through this occupation um, and global policing of the world that we can remain safe and free. Likewise, the arguments for uh, the state of Hawaii to co-opt and coexist with the US military is this fiction of Hawaii's strategic location in the Pacific as a way to pivot toward Asia. Um, and likewise, um, largely um, the fiction that uh, the Korean Peninsula must remain divided and this division is necessary um, for our safety. And this I trace to a long genealogy of the U.S. Um, antagonizing North Korea. Um, and we can pinpoint a moment such as um, George Bush naming North Korea as a part of the axis of evil. Um, and a lot of the learning that I've done that, I, that is reflected in this novel has been through organizations such as Nodoto. So I'm really grateful uh, for Chu Hyun being here. And if you're not following them right now, um, Nodoto on Instagram or Twitter, please do so immediately. Um, just this past week, they did a post about addressing you know, where we get our, or where we inherit our nuclear anxiety. Um, we always think that and posit that North Korea is the bearer of our future demise. Um, but I wanna reframe that um, in the context of what I just brought up, um, how um, the threat is already here and it's all over the world. The threat is US militarization, um, which is um, the largest contributor to climate change, but also, as I mentioned, um, contributing to the destruction of the planet um, in unseen and very visible ways. Um, so yeah, leading it all to preface uh, my reading from the last chapter. Um, this is a multi-perspective novel, which initially centers on the Cho family, um, but soon expands to look at, look beyond the relations and the framework um, that is the fiction of the nuclear family household uh, to, to look at who is and isn't considered family. Um, which is a lesson that Grace and her narrative arc um, traces in her arriving to Ho'ulu Aina and participating in the community work day and thinking about the genealogical relationships of land that uh, settler communities in particular do not have but then can articulate through engaging in this um, economy of reciprocity. Um, so 
The last chapter is chaotic. Um, it follows, it starts with the Cho family and moves to all these other different characters. Um, but it also shifts from um, human to non-human beings. And uh, that's where I'll start. The mosquitoes descended from those brought to Hawaii in 1826, having since killed countless honey creepers, avoided the smoke of green coils stationed around homes, circling to their dying ends. The mongooses descended from those brought in 1883 to help eradicate rats in the sugarcane fields, continued to dart from hiding to hiding preying on the nestlings of native birds and feasting on turtle eggs. An elepayo flew above Lualuale Valley and landed to take a break on the 1,500-foot-tall VLF radio transmitter the U.S. Navy used to communicate with submarines. The brown bird shook off an oncoming headache before taking flight. The pigeons went about pick, pecking around trash cans out of styrofoam. The feral cats ate from piles of food left out by humans and slept under cars for shade during the hot morning. Dogs enclosed behind fences at the Humane Society wondered if anyone would adopt them. In Sherwood Forest, hoary bats stared at the bulldozers parked near their home and wondered where they would go. From the mountains, feral pigs evaded hunters, ran across state-designated hiking trails, ran through military training grounds, ran through seized lands. The pigs in town ran into the Honolulu Country Club to hang out on the golf course. A pueo flew across Makua Valley and landed on the skeleton of a dead kiavi tree long burnt by two nights of military-controlled burns that went out of control. Not far off from the Kiave, past the Haole Koa trees, a mo'o crawled through the dry stacked stones of an ahu along a stream bank, appreciating the ho'okupu laid there an offering of flowers. Down to the shore, after birthing 10 pups already, Rocky the monk seal wanted to be left completely alone on the beach after so much surveillance and media attention. The few remaining opihi who hadn't been devoured or turned into pendants grazed on algae as they crept across rocks, wondering what had become of their families scraped off by knives. On the shores of Waimanalo, Limu that were woven into a lei of raffia and tied around rocks, carried into the water by helping hands, released spores to spread in the water and seed new limu beds. Despite many facing the ongoing threat of bleaching, some species of coral, like the Montipora capitata or Poritas compressa, experienced downtime in this colder, calmer climate when there weren't as many tourists and there was less light during the day, slowing down their growth through decreased metabolism. The bushy cauliflower coral surrounding the islands bode their time, already in crisis, hoping to be considered endangered like their cousins, the elkhorn and staghorn corals. Green sea turtles covered in fibril papilloma continued eating the algae that would bring them tumors and high nitrogen counts caused by runoff and pollutants. And they would commemorate a tourist's visit to Hawaii as an ankle tattoo, neighbor to an outline of Mickey ears for a stay at the Alani Resort. Deep in the ocean, the sharks sensed electrical pulses and vibrations of fear thundering from the shore. People leaving the water, not ha for having sensed them, as if it were the ocean that were a threat. 
the people feared something more menacing and capable of violence than the sharks, who remembered how they were once threatened months before Hawaii became a state, killed as bounties for rewards up to $100. The sharks would continue being demonized, no thanks to bad movies decades later, mistaken as dangerous as missiles, when every summer, countries across the world would test their weapons and fire them over and into the ocean during RIMPAC. The shark's silhouettes underwater caused great fear when the sharks themselves wondered what could be as menacing as an aircraft carrier sailing across their ocean, capable of blotting out the sun. Back on the land, the mountains, the forests, the plants, and the stones did not think about what they would lose should a missile come their way. They continued to survive as themselves, living and breathing. In the irrigated terraces of Waihole Valley, Mauna Wili, Punalu'u, Haleiwa, Heia, Haiku, Kanevai, and Waianae, Lo'i Kalo stood, greeting one another as they shared water cascading in the wind. And I'll stop right there. Thank you all so much. Hi, I'm Hi'ile. Thank you, Mariko, for the invitation. Thank you to the APA. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Amita. It's really nice to be here. I'm going to read from some new work that I've been doing. Um, this is the first time I've shared it in public, so I'm a little bit nervous. Um, but I was really happy to have an opportunity to talk about ghosts. I was sitting in my dimly lit faculty office on Yale University's campus, boxes half unpacked from my recent move from Austin, Texas, and speaking on the phone with Edward Halealoha Ayao, a Kanaka Uivi cultural practitioner and repatriation specialist. Ayao runs Huivi Kuomo'o, an organization that builds community capacity for the protection and care of Native Hawaiian ancestral remains and funerary objects. Part of his work includes identifying items illicitly held by institutions outside of Hawaii and facilitating their rightful return. When I explained to him that Yale's Peabody Museum had a collection of Native Hawaiian teeth and mandibles in its possession, he asked me to repeat myself since he was under the impression that Yale had given everything back years ago. If the news I delivered was a surprise, it perhaps shouldn't have been. Throughout the 19th century, Western institutions like Yale amassed large collections of bones, materials its faculty would use for the pseudoscientific study of racial difference. I had known of this practice for some time, though I don't think I had fully comprehended how those histories of collection and objectification actually set the tone for my presence in the academy as both specter of and substructure for my eventual equitable inclusion into it until I stumbled upon my own ancestors. Since then, I have become increasingly curious about the relationship between ghosts and homeland. What does it mean to live a life so far from one's ancestors? How do you make sense of it when you unexpectedly find them in the diaspora too, also longing to return? How do you make peace with those ghosts? For most of my life, I had assumed that haunting was a personal matter. However, as Ungunak scholar Eve Tuck and artist C. Ree suggest in their essay, Glossary of Haunting, ghosts are contextual beings. Individuals are haunted, they write, but so are societies. If the violence of settler colonization sets the context for an indigenous spectral present, then historical efforts to exterminate native peoples have paradoxically produced a kind of indelibility to settler society. Even though we were meant to die out, 
we are also foundational to the myth of manifest destiny, and so the idea of us remains a lamentable but necessary historical fact, even when we are so clearly still here. Tuck and Rhee go on to argue that, quote, haunting doesn't hope to change people's perceptions, nor does it hope for reconciliation. For ghosts, the haunting is the resolving. It is not what needs to be resolved. Put another way, trying to settle the matter may be counterintuitive when our refusal to disappear sets the conditions for the haunting itself. Ayao and I had met only a couple of months earlier when I interviewed him about 14 ivi po'o, or human skulls, that he had repatriated and reinterred in October 2020 at the Nu'uwanu'pali Nu'u Nu'u State Wayside Park, a scenic lookout point that straddles the Ko'olau mountain range on the island of Oahu. Once a precarious mountain pass, the park now sits above a pair of twin tunnels completed in 1958 which superseded the old highway that connected the towns of Kaneohe, Kailua, and Waimanalo to the city of Honolulu. Long before that, however, it was the location of Kalele uh, Ka'anai, a significant and bloody battle that secured Kamehameha the Great's rule over the Hawaiian archipelago in 1795. Despite the indignity of its transformation into a tourist backdrop and traffic jam, the thoroughfare still stuns. The sprawling windward view that bleeds into turquoise ocean, the sheer wind-battered cliffs that plunge into emerald valleys, and the gap in the range where the setting sun streams through in crisp celestial beams. A distinctive peak shaped like an incisor tooth marks where Oahu's warriors pushed up the valley and onto the ridge, chose the precipice over surrender to an invading army. The Evi Po'o who returned after their 120-year after residency at Cambridge University, England, to be buried at Pali State Wayside are unusual in several respects, one of which is that they mostly belong to women who fought in that battle, though it is unclear whether R.L. Perkins, the British entomologist who stole them from the base of the Pali sometime in the late 1800s, was aware of their sex. Perkins, who was in Hawaii to study insects, had no business collecting skulls. Nevertheless, he would transport his plunder back to England and deposit them into the Duckworth Laboratory's collections in 1902. The remains of these elite female warriors would remain there unnoticed until around 2012 when Oyao began working the case. It would turn into the most complex repatriation project of Ayao's career, taking over a decade to complete. In its first few years, especially, it inched forward unproductively, hitting bureaucratic roadblocks at Duckworth and taking a backseat to the demands of Ayao's employment at the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. The tenor of the case changed, however, when the ancestors found him. It started with stomach cramps. As he told it, they came on debilitatingly fast. Soon, he was so doubled over in pain that he nearly asked his wife to take him to the hospital. But on that particular evening, her cousin happened to be in town, and this unplanned family obligation kept him home, in agony, entertaining instead. They sat in conversation for a while until, abruptly, the cousin's demeanor shifted. He turned and locked eyes with Ayao and asked in a strange voice, why have you forsaken us? Why are you not helping to get us home? He lifted his arm and pointed to the door that led into Ayao's home office. What I'm talking about is in that room. And this cousin is known to be gifted with Ike Papa Lua, a kind of second sight. And whether he knew it at the time or not, he pointed to where Ayao kept his international repatriation files. Sitting there at the top of the pile was the Duckworth folder. And as Ayao started to figure out what was going on, the pain lifted as quickly as it came on. What that alerted me to, he told me, was that there were some very powerful personalities amongst these kupuna. This story, though it hadn't been far from my mind since he told it to me a couple of months earlier, came to the surface as we discussed the matter of the teeth and the mandibles, 
still sitting in a storage room at Yale's Peabody's West Campus facilities. They were, as it turned out, supposed to have gone back to Hawaii in 2014 with the rest of the collection that they matched. Put politely, the remains had been mishandled and nobody thought to tell their native Hawaiian contacts as much. And this, I realize, is kind of strange language for describing the violence of the situation, though I'm not sure I know how to write about the disassembly of my ancestors in any other way. It would have probably for many more years gone unsaid had I not, on the third day of my first semester at my new job, thought to ask the institution's NAGPRA compliance officer whether they had any EV in their possession. It was an impromptu question I asked while taking a collections tour of their facility. The officer replied, yes, brought me to the room where they kept repatriation objects, lifted the lid off the pale yellow archival box that held them, and I sobbed. And so a few weeks later, after a follow-up meeting with the compliance officer to confirm that there was no good reason, bureaucratic or otherwise, why these bones should not be immediately returned, I'm on the phone with Ayao, who's telling me that when it comes to ancestors who want our help getting home, there are no coincidences. He also said to me that the timing of our reconnection was fortuitous, even if the circumstances weren't. He was scheduled to be in Poughkeepsie at Vassar College in a matter of weeks, and if I could bring the Evie there, he would transport them the rest of the way to Hawaii. Across the following week, myself and some Kanaka Maoli undergrads, two of whom are here tonight, attended Zoom meetings with Mana and Kalahua Caceres, a husband and wife team who taught us the cadence of the chants, but also trained us in proper handling and comportment. Kalahua suggests during our lessons that the Evie at the Peabody had been waiting for me. At that point, I believed her. Eve Tuck and C. Re likened settler colonialism to the literary and filmic genre of horror in which ghosts become the, quote, relentless remembering and reminding of genocidal violence and subjugation. The relationship between ghosts and the people and places they haunt, then, hinges on the wound of dispossession that does not heal. But while haunting may be useful for conceptually teasing out the messiness of power, as Avery Gordon puts it in their book, Ghostly Matters, Life is Complicated, I have come to believe that our language for haunting must be tailored if we are to understand a people, a place, and their ghosts beyond abstracted asymmetries of power. What does it look like to relinquish possession rather than simply repossess? Looking to Native Hawaiian concepts of haunting offers more complete and precise formulations that do not require the trauma of colonization for its expression. In Olelo Hawaii, the word for haunting is ho'opahulu. Importantly, this term can also be used to describe soil that has been exhausted from over farming. Calling attention to the connections between land and spirit, aina and ea, then ho'opahulu invites us to think about haunting beyond colonial geographies. When I asked Ayao what it felt like to rebury our ancestors, he used the term replanting, invoking the double meaning of ho'opahulu and hinting at the idea that as ghosts are quieted, soil too becomes replenished. In this case, correctly replanting Evi required listening to the desires of the kupuna to whom they belonged. Rather than returning them to the foot of the cliff from where they were stolen, a reburial site was selected within the park, set back from the precipice. Those handling the Ivi Po'o on the evening of their reburial took care not to recapitulate the trauma of battle. As the Ivi Po'o were walked from the parking lot to the site, their gaze would be oriented toward the lush cradle of Nu'uanu Valley. And as they arrived at their new resting place, the group danced a hula for Kavailele o Nu'uanu, a mele about waterfalls, so that the beauty of the mountains would be the last thing they saw as they finally returned to Po. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Chu Hyun. I am from Noruto for Korean Community Development. 
Norutol is an organization that was founded in 1999. Uh, our mission is as Koreans and comrades uh, in the so-called United States to uh, organize our diaspora for anti-imperialist struggle and for the national liberation struggle. Uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, food sovereignty and imperialism in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I'd like to start with a couple of quotes. The first is from Franz Fanon. For a colonized people, the most essential value, because the most concrete, is first and foremost the land, the land which will bring them bread and above all dignity. Secondly, from Thomas Sankara, the socialist leader of Burkina Faso. Look at your plates when you eat, these imported grains of rice, corn, and millet, that is imperialism. So to start with, a little bit of information about the historical relationship between the Korean people and the seas that so lovingly embrace our peninsula. Uh, I want to refer to two artifacts. The first is the Pangude pe uh, petroglyph, which is a uh, rock carving that is about 5,000 years old. It is uh, one of, if not the earliest, uh, visual depiction of whaling in human history. Um, so it tells us a little bit about the ancient relationship of the peoples of the peninsula to the seas around them. And secondly, this is a map from the Pekje kingdom of the sea routes that uh, were controlled by uh, the kingdom of Pekje, running between China and the archipelago to known today as Japan. Uh, Pekje is sometimes referred to by historians of this period as the Phoenicians of East Asia, in the sense that their control over this trade route was an important source of wealth, for the kingdom and an early source of development in the peninsula as well. Fast forwarding about a thousand or so years, this is a map of the global silver trade in the 16th century. When early colonization began uh, with the rounding of the Cape of Africa, uh, the, sorry, the Cape of Good Hope and also uh, the so-called discovery of the Americas, more so the process of Columbus becoming lost, um, the, first, uh, the first truly global commercial network was created. Uh, the main leg of this was the Manila Galleons, which connected the Philippines uh, to uh, the Americas via Mexico and then onwards to the Iberian Peninsula. This was the main artery of silver trade around the world at this time. What were they trading the silver for? For the luxury goods of Asia, the things that Columbus had set sail initially to find. Uh, the reason why they needed silver was because Europe did not have very many advanced manufacturers of its own and therefore had very little to offer that was of interest to uh, the uh, producers in either China or in Southeast Asia. Now, there was another uh, portion of this global network which was controlled by the Portuguese. I want to particularly highlight the far end of this, uh, the connection between Macau and Nagasaki. Uh, this was the process of Portugal monopolizing trade between Japan and China. And as a result of this, Japan ended up supplying a third of the global silver in this era. And these introductions of uh, new economics, uh, new ecology, would really transform the history and the trajectory of this entire region. Uh, in the next slide, I'll share a little bit of information about how this incipient formation of global capitalism impacted Korea at this nexus in history. So the re uh, this process ultimately brought about two important historical changes. The first was the reunification of Japan and the, secondly, the second was the downfall of the Ming Dynasty, which was ultimately laid low by climactic and financial disruptions that were introduced by the Europeans. As a result of this, Korea suffered back-to-back -back invasions that absolutely devastated the peninsula. The first were the Imjin Wars, and here we have uh, some examples of European-style firearms that were used by the Japanese in this invasion. And then secondly, by the Qing Dynasty, uh, which was a Manchu dynasty that eventually uh, re-established uh, control over China and then uh, aimed to subjugate uh, the kingdom of Chosun or Korea at the time in order to re-establish its place in the tributary system. As a result of this, Korea pivoted towards a policy of isolationism that lasted for several centuries. This is the source of the nickname that Korea was given as the Hermit Kingdom when contact with Westerners became more frequent. In the next slide, we'll fast forward a little bit to talking more about Korea in the proper imperialist era. And what I mean by that is uh, drawing on the Marxist-Leninist definition of imperialism as a specific stage of capitalism when it reaches a particular point of monopoly formation. Uh, the reason why I think it's important for us to distinguish between these processes is that what we were seeing in the early 16th slash 17th centuries was a process of feudal warfare. 
This is a different process whereby imperialist powers were seeking to bring the totality of the productive forces of not only Korea, but the broader Asia Pacific region under the control of monopoly capital. And there are three specific historical processes we need to highlight to understand Korea's colonization by Japan. The first is the opening of China through the Opium Wars in the 19th century. The second is manifest destiny as both a continental and an oceanic process. I highlight the oceanic there because it, as early as the 1840s, President Tyler was seeking to uh, extend the Monroe Doctrine to apply to the Kingdom of Hawaii. Additionally, um, the conquest of uh, the northern areas of Mexico in the Mexican-American War were also uh, greatly driven by a desire uh, by the, uh, the United States to access the Pacific and thereby to be able to compete in the colonial domination of trade in Asia. Lastly is the capitalist transition in Japan, which was a process that initiated as a result of these earlier two. And without going through all the dates and all the history, I will just highlight the most important bits, which is the first imperialist attempts to open Korea to capital, uh, beginning with the United States uh, in the late 1860s and 70s. Here we have a photo from uh, the first uh, incident in which the US Navy stole a flag of defenders at uh, Kangwa Island in Korea a battle which uh, ultimately resulted in the slaughter of 300 Korean uh, soldiers. And then finally in 1876 when Japan succeeded in opening Korea and receiving a lot of the same trade concessions uh, that had previously been wrested from China. So things like access to ports, free trade, free trade, um, and all these other uh, types of things that are still with us today uh, in the capitalist system as it attempts to uh, organize the robbery and plunder of the colonial world. If we want to think about the political economy of colonialism, I think it's important to think about this as a class process. And I would highlight a particular quote from Marx. So-called primitive accumulation is nothing else than the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production. How is it that a working class, a proletariat, a wage-earning class is created in any place? It's through the seizure of the land, the seizure of the means of subsistence from the producers. If the people cannot feed themselves, then they must come to you to earn money in order to do so. So in Korea, what this process looked like is a communal system of land was replaced by a capitalist system of private property. Peasants were then transformed into evictable tenants who had to pay rent in kind, which is another way of saying they paid rent in non-monetary forms. So through barley, through grain, through rice. Evicted tenants could then become proletarians who worked for a wage in Korea, Japan, and Manchuria, feeding the system of industrial expansion and capitalist, ex uh, capitalist growth of the Japanese empire. And by 1945, this process was so successful that the Japanese Oriental Development Company owned 64% of the dry rice lands and 80% of the wet rice lands in Korea. So this is this process of the concentration of monopoly taking place in real time. What effect did this have on the foodways of Korea? Within the span of a generation, over a thousand rice varieties went extinct. Rice production did become centralized, which resulted in a, the growth of the uh, output in a net sense. However, what this also meant was that the supply of inputs was dominated by the Japanese monopoly capital. The Korean farmer needed to use Japanese fertilizers, Japanese seeds, Japanese tools. All of this had to be purchased, and of course, that resulted in a process of driving the peasantry into debt which was then a means to then take the land from them and force them to join the ranks of the labor force. At the same time that the net volume of rice production was increasing, per capita rice consumption in Korea fell from 124 liters in 1914 to 77 liters by 1929. As a point of comparison, in that same year of 1929, per capita rice consumption in Japan was 198 liters per person. Fluctuations in the rice prices in the 1930s also devastated the peasantry since their livelihood had become connected to the highs and lows of the capitalist market, the boom and bust cycle of uh, the capitalist mode of production. I'm skipping around between lots of historical periods because I don't have too much time. <laughs> um, if we want to advance now to the Korean War, we also can think about the process of really genocidal violence, of the destruction of the peninsula as also a process of underdevelopment. Um, and I want to highlight that through thinking about food. First, by sharing some initial information about the scale of violence uh, in this war. It's an estimated three to five million people who were killed in the peninsula and more than five million internally displaced. 
I want to read a couple of quotes and also a um, artifact from the US Air Force. The first is from the General Curtis LeMay, who was the commander of the bombing campaign over North Korea. This is from an interview some years later where he said, so we went over there and fought the war and eventually burned down every town in North Korea and some in South Korea too. Over a period of three years or so, we killed what? 20% of the population of Korea? And here is a um, telegram that was sent in July 1950 from an Air Force commander to a uh, general in the Pentagon uh, requ reporting on the status of uh, air support uh, in the early phase of the war. The Army has requested that we strafe, that's fire machine guns at, all civilian refugee re parties that are noted approaching our positions. To date, we have complied with the Army request in this respect. The intentional targeting of civilians and infrastructure is laid out very clearly here. Um, and I want to highlight a couple of points. Uh, firstly, that uh, this was another process of separating the producers from their land. When you kill people's families, when you drive them from their villages, they have nowhere to go back to. So where do they concentrate in the case of South Korea? Around the military bases, in the cities. Uh, in the process of bombing Korea, the U.S. deployed 635,000 tons of bombs and more than 32,000 tons of napalm. This is more explosive ordnance than was used in the entire Pacific theater of World War II. And lastly, in 1953, as negotiations for the armistice were at a, lock, um, at a standstill, what the United States did to uh, increase its leverage was intentionally bomb four major agricultural dams in the north, uh, impacting about two-thirds of irrigation in North Korea. Um, the uh, possibility of famine was only averted thanks to the support of the fraternal socialist countries, uh, but this was an intentional attempt to really starve out uh, the people of the DPRK in order to br bring about a conclusion to the conflict. Uh, these are tactics that the United States continues to, to deploy to this day. Fast forwarding a little bit into the present, we can think about Korean foodways in the context of contemporary imperialism as well. In the 1960s, the US-backed military dictator Park Chung-hee set caps on rice prices in order to drive farmers further into debt and push more of the rural population into the cities as a proletarian workforce. By 2000, South Korea, or the Republic of Korea, was 80% urban. This is a total flip of the situation in 1945, when it was more than 80% rural. In 2007, the United States imposed a free trade agreement, which further opened South Korean markets to uh, US agricultural imports. Today, South Korea is the eighth largest agricultural importer in the world, despite being the historic breadbasket of the Korean Peninsula. It is also the fifth largest export market for US agriculture. I want to highlight as well uh, some particular episodes of how uh, food, uh, food producers and U.S. military expansion come into conflict in the contemporary period. This photo down here in the bottom left is from the Pyeongtaek base expansion struggle. Uh, in the city of Pyeongtaek, the uh, U.S. base known as Camp Humphreys is now the largest U.S. military base outside North America. There was an expansion process that took place between 2006 and 2014 that required the expropriation of land from nearby villages that were populated by farmers. This is a photo of those same farmers defending their land from Korean riot police. Over on the right, we have photos as well of protests surrounding uh, base expansions in Jeju Island uh, and in Songju, where the US is currently installing a missile, uh, so-called defense shield known as THAAD. Uh, part of the local concern over the implementation of THAAD uh, in their land is not only the fact that it will take land from them, but also that the radio uh, or the radar system that is used by THAAD will negatively impact uh, the production of chame, the Korean melon, uh, which is uh, frequently grown in this area. I also uh, want to highlight the uh, importance of the US toxic uh, military legacy in the ROK. Uh, over, since 2004, over 40,000 acres of land have been returned uh, to the Korean people by the US military. I have to laugh because the returns also entail the expansions that I just shared with you. Um, as they return this land after they've destroyed it, they say, well, we need new land now that we haven't destroyed yet. Um, there are high carcinogen levels that have been found in 22 out of 23 of these uh, returned bases. This is a photo of an excavation at Camp Carroll where the US military secretly buried Agent Orange in the 1970s and then lied about it for 30 years. Um, and the estimated cost of cleanup is believed to be about half a billion dollars, which the U.S. has refused to pay. All costs of environmental cleanup that have taken place so far have been done through the South Korean government. 
Now, in the inverse, I want to highlight uh, what food and agriculture looks like under socialism in the DPRK. In 1946, one year after uh, the f defeat of Japan in World War II and the liberation of Korea, uh, land reform expropriated all the landlords and gave land to the peasants. This was the fastest process of land reform, I believe, on Earth. It took about 20 days, uh, returned over 2 million acres of land to hundreds of thousands of families. Uh, one thing I want to highlight here is uh, colonization is the process through which the imperialist seize, seizes the productive forces of a people. Decolonization, to be a little crass, is when we take that shit back. And that's what happened here. Agriculture was voluntarily collectivized in the 1950s and then fully mechanized by 1980. Now, this may sound as a surprise for some of you who are more familiar with a story of the DPRK as a place of starvation. We need to contextualize that as particularly in the 1990s when the effects of climate change begin to become more apparent in the peninsula. It was record flooding that destroyed most of the, not only the farmland, but also the power production capacity of the DPRK in that period and really laid low its ability to um, organize its economy in any sense, including uh, in the mode of food production, and the DPRK was largely left to rebuild on its own while still under sanctions from the United States. Since then, new systems of agroecology have been in place and been developing over time, but the land continues to be collectively owned and managed through cooperatives that are controlled by the producers themselves. Unfortunately, because of the effects of uh, uni unilateral sanctions from the United States, uh, the process of actually restoring uh, the DPRK's capacity for food production is blocked primarily uh, by these uh, sanctions measures. And because of the US's position as global hege uh, hegemon, uh, which in this case is primarily enacted through the hegemony of the dollar, as well as its position on the UN Security Council, it's able to coerce the participation of the wider globe in these sanctions. Uh, I wanna talk specifically about how it impacts the agricultural system. There are caps on the imports of fuel, as well as bans on the imports of vehicles and metal items, all metal items, uh, which as you can imagine will severely impact the capacity of the uh, people of Northern Korea to develop their agriculture. Uh, some of the ways in which um, the DPRK is continuing to resist this is through state support for personal cultivation of home gardens, um, as well as the introduction of goats and rabbits, actually. Um, this is a photo from our 2009 um, exposure trip to the DPRK, uh, organized by Norutol. Uh, this is some of our members gazing very fondly upon some goats that were owned by an agricultural cooperative. Now let's think a little bit about the prospects of reunification. Only 20% of the DPRK's land is arable, yet 80% of Korean farmland is in the south. National division perpetuates a, a process of national oppression under imperialism, and I mean specifically by that, the capitalist domination of the productive forces. Food sovereignty thus cannot be achieved without political sovereignty, without this process of reunification which must require the expulsion of the United States as the only viable path to Korea's food future and to its political future in general. To turn to the guinea bissauan Marxist-Leninist, Emilcar Cabral, we therefore see that colonialism and in neocolonialism, the essential characteristic of imperialist domination remains the same. The negation of the historical process of the dominated people by means of violent usurpation of the freedom of development of the national productive forces. Uh, just wanna quickly share um, this still from the RIMPAC exercises, which depicts um, <clears throat> soldiers with the US military conducting a practice exercise in a compound that they built and then took the time to add a photo of Kim Jong-il to, which I think tells you what exactly uh, the purpose of exercises like these are for. So to highlight, um, given the nature of our panel, I wanna speak briefly on the necessity of anti-imperialism as a trans-Pacific process. Uh, over here is a map of how the U.S. military conceives of its strategy in the Pacific as a series of islands chains that connects Hawaii, Guam, Taiwan and the Philippines, Japan and Korea. Um, the U.S. is currently in a phase of military expansion uh, centered around a pivot towards uh, the new Cold War against China in which the DPRK is also uh, conceived as a primary antagonist. And for those of us in the USA, we should be asking what is to be done how do we take up this process of turning the imperialist war into a civil war of uh, bringing down a system of capitalism for the purpose of achieving the liberation and the possibility of new life throughout the world? Thank you.
I think a couple of key themes that are coming across in the panel are kind of thinking about the political possibilities of foodways as well as um, these kind of questions about haunting and memory and um, sort of like relationship between past, present, future. Um, I guess uh, maybe I'll start with Professor Han. Um, you know, there's, there's all the many places that food and eating are described in the book. Um, and there's this moment when, when Grace is at Ho'ulu Aina and um, she's, she's slowing down and she's chewing and um, the kind of contrasting this meal that she's eating um, in the garden with uh, the way that food production works uh, at the Cho's restaurant and uh, I think you, you say, you know, they're concerned with meeting demands for consistency, uh, a certain volume of food that can be doled out at any moment to the customer's convenience. And you sort of um, contrast these two different visions of abundance, the kind of abundance uh, that is vai vai, that's at Ho'ula Aina with the, um, I think you call it the illusion of abundance at, at the Cho's. And I guess um, I am just... I don't know, wanting to invite you to talk more about that maybe in terms of both these, these two different forms of abundance and also what's going on with time in this moment where she's, she's slowing down as opposed to the constant kind of like go, go, go of the restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question, Mariko. Um, yeah, I wrote that in thinking about Grace's narrative arc. Um, as a stoner, um, and how she, how her narrative is about excess, um, you know, never having enough, and I think that relationship to food translates broadly to um, the way Hawaii is advertised as a liberal, multicultural gathering place where you could have anything you want, um, especially regarding global cuisine. Um, but as uh, Ju Hyun um, was talking about, uh, in Hawaii, the lands are primarily used to feed the military industrial complex more than it is, it is allowed to feed um, the people of Hawaii. Um, about 24% um, of Hawaii is occupied by the US military. And though there are efforts for these lands to be returned, um, such as the ongoing effort for a portion of Makua Valley to be returned, that still does not account for how Makua Valley is um, uh, totally polluted and littered with unexploded ordinances. So when groups like Malama Makua hold have um, these access visits so that folks from the community can reconnect um, with the land. Um, they need to be guided by um, a bomb squad person um, to make sure that no one steps on anything. Um, but likewise, uh, the symbol of the Korean plate lunch, I think, is an apt one for um, speaking to this, this wish for um, excess um, when out of uh, a sense of scarcity that you can never have enough. Um, that's one of the reasons why um, Oahu has, I think, the, what is the, the busiest Costco um, in the US. Um, and uh, yeah, so our, our appetites are conditioned by around uh, this um, heavily militarized context um, and for Grace to realize that um, by eating from the land was the moment that I wanted to write toward um, in wrapping up her, her story. Next I have a question for you Professor Hobart about um, like 
this is this is going back uh, to your book, if that's okay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't talk about any of no. that. No, oh my God, that, th this was amazing. Um, in in the conclusion, you write about your experiences working in the kitchen at at Pu'u Honua or Pu'u Hulu Hulu, and mm -hmm. you. Um, uh, I feel like you're, you're, you're theorizing the camp kitchen as a form of food sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? And you, and you write, you know, donated food flowing into the camp represented a diversity of community resources, huge buckets of fried chicken and chili from fast casual restaurants, cardboard boxes of fruits picked from backyard trees, pallets of shelf-stable snack foods, and canned goods grabbed from home pantries. And I guess... Um, I don't know, I'm not trying to like put you on the spot or something, but I'm just wondering if you want to say anything about sort of thinking about um, this, this form of food sovereignty alongside kind of um, what we've heard Professor Baker and Professor Hahn talking about mm -hmm. um, and like how, I don't know, how these things go, go together, where, what, what's divergent, like how it, this, I don't know, something about it feels like an opening of possibilities. Yeah, um, so I write a little bit about working in this camp kitchen. Um, my book is about like ice in the cold and refrigeration um, and how that affects native Hawaiian relationships with the environment, but also our food ways. Um, and Pu'uhonu o Pu'uhuluhulu was this um, encampment uh, set up at the base of the Mauna Kea Access Road to protect the Mauna and also to protest against the construction of this 30 meter telescope. Uh, and I, I just went as like a Native Hawaiian person, I wasn't there as a researcher, but then later on when I was reflecting back on the experience, um, I was really trying to think about like, how I was trying to make sense of the kitchen up there because I had been thinking a lot in the arena of food sovereignty for a really long time. And I was like, this doesn't look like what the books envisioned food sovereignty to look like. There was just so much industrial, industrially manufactured food up there. And at the same time, I just like, after thinking about it for a while, I started to come to realize that it was it was precisely food sovereignty in action because it set the conditions for occupation, right? And to, to protect land, to protect territory. And so sometimes the way that it work, gets worked out on the ground doesn't have to look like the textbook perfect land-centered vision of it if it gets people together at the right time to protect Aina. Um, and so for me, that really opened up a lot of possibilities for thinking about food sovereignty more generally and for thinking about food in Hawaii specifically, because I think that there's like that, like the purity of the concept sometimes does a real disservice to indigenous communities that are trying to make it happen with what they have ready at hand. And very often folks are like, oh, well, that's so, you know, you're just eating junk food and you're doing, you know, this or that or, you know, whatever those ideas are, when in fact it becomes profoundly decolonial when it gets set in that moment. Um, so that was really important for me to talk about, I think, at the end of a book. You, you know, I'm, I was thinking about Pu'u Hulu Hulu and, um, and one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking through are, um, you know, we imagine decolonial futures through theorization, um, through praxis, which is stuff that comes out of what people actually do. And you make these theories, but you have to go back to what they actually do, which is if the call goes out to an anti, in, anywhere in Hawaii that, I mean, Pu'uhuluhulu was amazing because, you know, we, we, they all, I don't eat zippies, but, you know, that is, that is where you could access something to give, and the call is out, so you give, and that is a groundbreaking event, right? I mean, that, that's exactly what, what you're saying, but yeah, that is, that, that is the decolonial moment. Mm -hmm. and, and it also leads to strategies for, for really living um, in the present. Like Pu'uhuluhulu becomes a model for 
um, a way of life which may not be, which may be a few generations down the line, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like my, my mo'opuna, you know, the, the descendants from um, who were there will then recreate that and keep recreating it and demanding that it be recreated yeah. in, in something. Yeah. But yeah, I, I loved, it. It, your story was classic about <laughs> Organizing the camp kitchen, she was like one of the, one of the big, right, right. Thank you both. Um, I guess we are uh, almost out of time. Uh, this has gone by so fast. Um, I want to uh, maybe end. Is this last question? No. Couple. Okay. Okay. So next question um, to to Jiyun. I, uh, Professor Baker, you just this phrase str like strategies for living in the present. Um, I guess, and and we're kind of talking about organizing. I wanted to maybe invite you to say a little more if if you want <laughs> about um, I don't know, kind of like uh, thinking about Nodudol as an organization that has multiple locations as. Um, that's that is working in the diaspora and uh i guess if if there's anything you wanted to say about the challenges or possibilities that that offers um your your organization in um kind of trying to 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 do the visioning of reunification or like the the kinds of um like moments that you're working towards or does that make sense uh, regarding, regarding the visioning of reunification, the nice thing is that uh, Koreans on the peninsula have done a lot of that already. Um, so they don't really need us to vision for them. Uh, but uh, reunification is always uh, premised as a process that includes Koreans on both sides of the peninsula and overseas. Um, that's included as a part of the coming together of the Korean people. Um, I think when it comes to the matter of organizing in different locations, there are challenges, but what I would also highlight is that the system that we are opposing is in all places, and it needs to be resisted from all places as well. And the only play way that it can be resisted is through the formation of these kinds of revolutionary bonds and relations, which I think um, the other folks on this panel have done a really excellent job of talking about in their particular context. And you know how that is initiated through acts both big and small, whether it's uh, bringing uh, fried chicken or you know different things to a site of resistance, uh, whether it is a, a broader process of theorization or setting up centers uh, that serve community and facilitate a process of uh, reestablishing relationship to land. Um, so I think to keep things brief and ensure that other folks have a chance to share more of their wisdom, uh, I think it's really just about uh, finding the ways that we can from every place uh, bring about struggle. Uh, the Palestinian revolutionary uh, Hassan Kanafani said that imperialism has laid its body across the world. Its head is in Asia, its uh, heart is in Africa. He named a bunch of other body parts, but the point being that anywhere you strike it, uh, you do service towards the revolutionary process. So that's what I would share. Well, if I might say something about um, a concept of um, kipuka and kipuka aloha aina um, as, um, as these spaces, they are, they, they are generally, you know, small spaces and people will come to them and, and and say, wow, this is, this is such a different way of living and I want to live this way. And, and, and um, I, I, I firmly believe that many people then are, can take away to wherever they're living um, a, a way to ex experience abundance or I in their own homes. And, you know, we, one of the things that I'm working with with um, accomplices and allies, you know, in the settler world, where a lot of times they think about almost a kind of imperial way of of thinking of decolonial futures, because they want to um, scale up. And 
I'm just thinking now that this is an imperial way of thinking about decolonization. <laughs> that, that, that we have to train um, the, I, I, I know this is a gross exaggeration, but train these Western minds who are trained in this way of thinking that no, we don't wanna take an imperial approach. We want to go to where we stand, where we live, to the, to the local. Um, and that, that is where those transformations will happen. And, and we create these nodes, these, these networks, these flight paths, if you will, across, across the empire. I feel like there is something going on with health and healing and haunting, haunting as not the thing that needs to be resolved, but the resolution of the... Um, would anybody like to say more <laughs> about any of this? Uh, possibilities for healing, challenges, what, how I think all of your work is getting at different aspects of this, maybe? Yeah, so the premise of the novel around why there are ghosts that remain um, on the peninsula wishing to return um, and being met with the DMZ as a, as a spiritual barrier that prohibits them from crossing um, was very much informed by the practice of honoring your ancestors um, in um, the practice of chesa and making sure that your, your ancestors are fed and not only fed, but remembered. Um, and so too, only can we be nourished um, if our forebearers are nourished. Um, so I thought a lot about um, the term um, rest and peace and how it's, our peace is usually deferred uh, until our deaths. Uh, but even in death, um, I think the, the desecration that continues in our living reality continues to manifest um, across future generations and generations past, um, especially with the Korean War uh, being ongoing um, and manifesting in, in, in many different ways across the globe. Um, so yeah, it was that concept of um, the reciprocity of nourishment and what we can do um, through our everyday living to, to, uh, to nourish, nourish ourselves by evoking um, and bringing our ancestors with us um, and thinking about our, our collective spiritual health in a way. Thank you all so much for coming. There are books in the back uh, if you're interested in uh, purchasing Nuclear Family or Cooling the Tropics. Uh, you can do so right now. <laughs> um, and were there any other announcements I'm supposed to make? Okay. Uh, oh, and I just want to also shout out Sam Ikehara, who did a lot of uh, the like visioning work with me to put this panel together. So thank you, Sam. And yeah, thank you all, and thank you to our panelists. <laughs>